The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Let's just pray. Father, we have the message. We have the word of the Lord. We, Father, we pray that we would open our hearts to the timeliness of it and enter into the fulfillment of it. For with every word, there is, we become a partaker of the divine nature. But for every part that we become partaker of the divine nature, that residue remains in us. But God wants to express himself through us in the process. So, Father, we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. You're going to reveal yourself here this morning in a very significant and a very real way. The word God gave me for this morning is the God of the breakthrough is inside of you. The God of the breakthrough is inside of you. And I really believe that God is speaking this so clearly. And I'd like to begin with a, a verse out of Micah. Chapter 2, verse 13. And I accidentally, uh, in spite of the rest of the message on the Lord of the Breakthrough, I got up this morning, went into the kitchen, and opened my Bible and glanced down and saw my sermon in another verse. That's good confirmation. But this is the another verse, so I figured I would open with this one. It says, the one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out and pass through the gate and go out by it. Their king will pass before them, and the Lord will be at their head. In the Amplified Bible, verse 13, it says, the breaker, the Messiah, will go up before them. They will break through, pass in through the gate, and go out through it, and their king will pass on before them. The Lord is at the head. Basically, God speaking is that the breakthrough God is in you, and the breaker, the Messiah, he himself is going before you, but the breaker or the Messiah God that breaks through is on the inside of you. There's two aspects of breakthrough that we need to understand. Many people are waiting for a breakthrough in the atmosphere, and that can happen. But the real breakthrough is every baby step of obedience brings breakthrough. There's a responsibility upon the heart of the believer that if you truly want to prosper and receive breakthrough, you don't just wait for it, you respond in obedience. Every time you obey, it is God who is at work both to will and to perform. He breaks through any of the barriers in, his life, in your life. But I'm telling you, God is promising something significant. He that has ears to hear. I want you to anoint your hearts today because this message can go to your head and this message can go to your heart. And if you're watching by Ustream, I really want this message to go to your heart because he is speaking a significant now word for us. And it's in the form of the breakthroughs in your life. Uh, I heard it again and again. Remember, at the beginning of the year, one of the primary manifestations that God said, I'm going to reveal to you, was found in Isaiah 42, 13. It says, the Lord is going to go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. That's Jehovah Sabaoth, the man of war. He will cry out shout aloud, and he will prevail against his enemies. Say that back to me. He will prevail against his enemies. Now, he's going to rise up. He's going to manifest as the Lord of the breakthrough, as the mighty man, as Jehovah Sabaoth. All right? But basically what God is saying is that this, this breakthrough is moving significantly. I like the truth of God's word and say what it is, but I'm more excited about how do I apply that and, wh how, and why is it happening right now, all right? And I really believe that what God is doing is he's restoring back the fire, and it's the fire that was over the tabernacle in the wilderness, and it was the fire you saw descending on the, on the disciples at the upper room, but ultimately this now is the temple, 
And when the fire is above the temple, we move. When the fire is not upon the temple, it means something has distracted us from his presence. And what I find really interesting is in the Amplified Bible, I looked up all of the footnotes in relationship to the breaker, the Messiah, in Micah chapter 2, verse 13. Now I'm giving you two different verse 13s. Remember Isaiah 42, 13, the Lord's going to rise up like a mighty man. Um, you know, I've, I know you've heard this. And this is where God showed me in a vision earlier this year that he was breaking through a slimy, spaghetti-like net of agendas, soul ties, attachments to idols, which could be a person, place, or a thing. And he was rising up as a mighty man that this is going to be a key manifestation in his life. Now, God's telling me that there's an increase in the anointing that's coming. And this increase in the anointing, I want to use David's three anointings as kind of a way to see what God is doing. And keep in mind, I am totally convinced that fivefold ministers are to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, that the real job is the priesthood of the believer. The real job is to get people to rise up in, in the presence and in the anointing of God. Now, David's first anointing was in the place of obscurity. That's the place of real testing too because in the place of obscurity, nobody sees what you're doing except God. The word of God and you are having a relationship. You and Messiah Jesus are having relationship. David had relationship in the sheepfolds. But yet Samuel came, and in the midst of his brethren, even brethren that didn't know or understand what value their brother was made absolutely no difference. Flesh and blood sometimes fails to see the, the potential as God sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. But anyway, God spoke to Samuel, and he came. And David was anointed in the midst of his brethren. Only God really saw the potential in Bethlehem, the house of bread, the birthplace of Jesus. I like that. But David learned his spiritual identity from that point on is that he served God. You know, in Hebrews 12, when it says, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder between soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, and all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. David moved in a love relationship with his God in the sheepfolds when nobody was watching. If that is, that to me is primary truth of what God wants to get the body back to. That it's how you respond between you and God. You, there can be no reconciliation in the church person to person until there's been a thorough reconciliation with God. Without a reconciliation to God, without the holiness of God, you can't reconcile and move in the kind of anointing that God wants. God wants that pillar of fire that was over the tabernacle and over those disciples' heads to be in line over your heart. And that's a holy fire. And that's the love of God and the holiness of God are synonymous. And we're walking in a wishy-washy Christianity right now throughout the church that's giving in to false grace. And what they're doing is they're basically saying, oh, God is love. God is, I remember having to deal with our teenager on this. Oh, I can sin. God loves me. He understands. It's like I have this understanding, tolerant. Isn't that an interesting word? Tolerant daddy who tolerates my sin because he knows the way I am. She, she didn't last very long with me with that, but... <laughs> That was her concept of daddy in the sky. Now, she had lost her dad in an early age, so she formed an opinion of God based on probably what she wanted. And what she wanted was license. <laughs> and her spiritual father was basically a tolerant, understanding God who tolerated all her sin. And we see a lot of that in the church. But you cannot separate the holiness of God, the fire of God, from the presence of God and the love of God. Charles Wesley, in his development of his theology, was the purest. He just plain called it holy love. The gospel is holy love. You have to have both. There needs to be holiness as well as the love. 
So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, God's saying the breakthrough anointing is rising up in the midst of your congregation, in the midst of your own life, in the midst of the circumstances. And I want you to see, to be challenged, that every baby step of obedience brings another level of breakthrough. So never, never minimize your victories. Never minimize your victories because nobody can take a victory away from you. Once you've had that victory, you've moved forward and upward in a work of sanctification, in something where a deposit of his divine nature remains. Now, breakthrough means new levels. Breakthrough also means new jurisdictions, new authority. So it gets exciting because God's basically laying this out as a framework. I think this is going to be classic in our understanding of where we're going and what God's going to do for each and every one of us as he cultivates and matures and brings us to full stature. First of all, that he does his best work with all the great men and women of God. He's always done it in the midst of obscurity. Do you agree with that? He starts from obscurity because it's how you handle your relationship with God, not so much with other people, but how you handle it with God and how you're honest before him. David was anointed in the midst of his brethren, but only God knew and saw his true potential and identity and how to be a servant. That's what he learned. 1 Samuel 16 says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that time day forward. The Spirit of the Lord, picture that tongue of fire coming upon him, and what was he doing? He was sent out even after the anointing. What was he doing? He was primarily taking care of sheep in the pasture. So that means that what he cultivated there in learning the ways and the relationship with God, learning intimacy with God and the lordship of, of his Messiah was basically learned in the place of obscurity. Now, it's interesting because as time went on <clears throat> and he grew, and his, his level of anointing, it says, God, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and it was with him from that day forward. So in his obedience to God, he moved in what we would just call favor. The favor of God, regardless of the jurisdiction. And I believe that God, we're going to end with this, but I really believe that some of the reasons some people are not prospering is because the fire of the Lord is not directly over their heart, as we were singing in that song. Because it's your responsibility to prosper. God will teach you how to prosper, but it's your job to do it. You fulfill it. It doesn't just fall out of the sky. So, if this first anointing for all of us transpired in the place of obscurity, and still does, by the way, God's looking at how you behave privately. Not just when your boss is looking, your husband or wife is present. It's how you are with you and the Lord privately. That is the real test and will always be a test. But the second anointing of David came. Now, this brought him into a new level of anointing because wherever God places you, there is a corresponding anointing to accomplish the task. He was anointed the second time. David was anointed king over Judah after years of suffering as a fugitive from King Saul. Don't waste your sorrows and don't waste your defeats because I'm going to tell you something. God's going to turn those defeats into opportunities to where you saw that by responding properly, you are basically moving forward and upward in the anointing. You're going to move to a new level. So maybe from David's point of view, why is everything going wrong? Nothing's right. Why am I constantly being attacked? But instead of doing that, he inquired of the Lord and learned how to respond. Listen to me. Learned how to respond in every negative situation, every attack, uh, even of the enemy. It's not a question of, was that God or was that the enemy or is that flesh? It doesn't matter. How did you respond? All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So... Apparently, all those days of running from Saul, he learned some things in how to respond. How many remember stories in the scripture how gallantly and noble David responded even to Saul? Hmm? That attitude won the heart of God. He was a man after God's own heart. So in Judah, when the time came, it said David was anointed king over Judah after years of suffering as a fugitive from King Saul. The men of Judah came, 2 Samuel 2, verse 4. The men of Judah came and anointed David king over the house of Judah. How did he earn this? I love this because you know what? To me, he earned the anointing and the recognition of his own people, Judah. He recognized by reason of accomplishment 
recognizing obviously the favor of God is on this man. The anointing is on this man. We recognize that. That's proven ministry. That's not going to Bible college and getting ordained. Because you can do that. This was an ordination recognized based on proven ministry. Did he not? They didn't just pick his name out of a hat. It was based on seeing the favor and the accomplishment and the anointing of God on his life. Many are called, few are commissioned. But this commissioning came not just by Samuel, directed of God, but because of the favor of God and the way he responded, even in, when he was being attacked by Saul for those years, running from Saul, he learned to cultivate that heart from God and get victory after victory after victory. Well, I got good news for you, Lisa. It's going to happen fast. That's part of the message, that we're in a time of acceleration and we're going to start seeing these, these mountains be removed quickly until all is removed. Now, listen to this. The second anointing, suffering as a fugitive, they came and they anointed him. However, it was still a divided nation. Are you aware that historically when he was anointed king over Judah, it was still a divided nation? And that's where I see the church today. I still see it struggling in its ability to come together to be that one new man or to be that witness. And it's in the third anointing of David. Now, do you agree when he got anointed king over Judah that that was quite an elevation from the sheepfolds and from being a warrior hmm? and from running from Saul? <laughs> so there is a breakthrough into a new level, but there is a breakthrough in the new level that is compensated by jurisdiction. You know what I mean by jurisdiction? Your territory, your neck of the woods, your realm of authority, your sphere of influence. Only we're talking spiritual influence. He now has been under the anointing of God, raised up by God, and has a new sphere of influence. Obedience to the lesser created anointing for the greater. Because of proper responses in the small, obscure areas, he is now being recognized by Judah. Now, after, after a period of time, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 5, it says, David was anointed king over all Israel after, listen to this, after years of growing consistently stronger in war. This is the word of the Lord for each and every one of you. Don't worry about the little battles and the skirmishes. Every baby step of obedience and obedience brings breakthrough. Not just the kind that falls out of the sky, but the breakthrough of the breaker that who lives in you, the Messiah breaker in you breaks through because it's his will and he performs. Every time you yield to the obedience, he breaks through. Every time he breaks through, you basically conquer and in that conquering, God is basically saying, I'm increasing your anointing and your sphere of influence. David was anointed king over all Israel after years of consistently growing strong in war. In other words, growing strong in war means that he responded by inquiring of the Lord every step of the way and in obedience he grew stronger. That means greater anointing. Now he's moving to greater authority and a larger jurisdiction. God wants to increase your jurisdiction, but he does everything according to a pattern based on principles. You can't skip the pattern and the principles. And that is first and foremost, that fire has to be over the heart. That fire is holiness, and that holiness and love together get you where you need to go in increased anointing. The fire burns up the dross, as I heard somebody share. The fire burns up, they even burned up the idols with fire after they won the battle. So, I mean, we're right on target this morning, and I believe many of you are hearing the word of the Lord. Now, it says that... David was anointed king over all of Israel after years of consistently growing strong in war. This is the third anointing of David. He was in Jerusalem, the city of peace. And we'll get into that later because it's tied to Shalom, Jerusalem, the ultimate place for God's people. Now, David learned how to conquer his enemies 
without losing his primary identity of a servant spirit. Everything he did, he did it to please the king of kings. Second Samuel chapter 5 says, Therefore all of the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and they anointed king David over all of Israel. Now, here's the part that gets exciting. I'm telling you, this is, this is a download from God because I, I'm not smart enough to figure this stuff out. This is, I mean, I'm opening my Bible to the pages that have the answers on it. I mean, I'm not even have to do research. This is frightening. God must really want this across and says, well, Dennis will probably go off on a tangent. But here it is. Joshua 15, verse 63. Joshua 15. Now, you know, Joshua is a period in time where... If you read the whole book of Joshua, it basically is everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That was repeated throughout that book. So it was kind of the spirit of the age in Judges. Yeah. In the book of Judges, it was probably every three chapters you'd say, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Okay? It was kind of the theme or the spirit of the age. Now, in, in the book of Judges, but in uh, Joshua 15, verse 63... It says, as for the Jebusites, pay attention now, because this is, going to be, this is going to have prophetic implication on your life and where you're at right now. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out, could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem to this day. Now, to this day applies to the season in the book of Joshua. Okay? Can you see that? The Jebusites were in Jerusalem. I love it because David was anointed in the city of peace in Jerusalem. Now, it goes on to say, and this is the verse that God basically... First Chronicles 13, verses 1 through 3. This is the background. David's triumph over his enemies all started, all began with him thinking about bringing back the ark after having taken Jerusalem from the Jebusites. Those, the Jebusites are the barriers and the hindrances in our Jerusalem, in our city, in our coming together in peace. It says that 1 Chronicles 13, verses 1 to 3, David said to the assembly of Israel, let us bring back the ark of our God back to us, for we have not inquired of him since the days of Saul. What was important to God was important to David. That is key. And for us as individuals, that's foundational. What's important to God needs to be important to us. We need to bring back the ark and put Jesus in his rightful place in our life in this temple. And the breaker anointing, the breakthrough anointing will flow out. It's going to be a holiness, the fire, as well as the love of God. The fire of God, the holiness, it's a holy love. And you cannot separate the two. Those that separate the two basically are going to be stragglers and wanderers but not the ones after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart is one that basically says, what's important to God is important to me. When we say that, when we bring back the ark and put Jesus in his rightful place, the God of many breakthroughs is with us. It gets better. It's not just the God of the breakthrough one time. It is the God of many breakthroughs. And let me read to this. This is First, Corin uh, First Chronicles chapter 14, verses 8 to 17. Now, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over all Israel, the enemy gets mad when he hears you doing something right. When you're increased anointing and increased authority, there will be increased repercussion. But consider it pure joy because it's a testimony Higher levels, higher devils, they used to say. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, but Paul would say, 
a door of opportunity, an effectual door of opportunity has been opened up to me, and there are many adversaries. He could care less about the adversaries. He knew they were going to be mowed down because God went before him, and God opened. God's the one that opens the door. I open a door no man can shut. Your obedience going through the door and responding properly will be victory after victory after victory after victory. And I believe God is speaking to Kingdom Life Church. He's speaking to us individual believers. I believe he's speaking this message to the body at large, that when the Philistines heard that he was anointed king over all Israel, he's moving in his third level of anointing now. It's been recognized. He's been given new jurisdiction, which means part of that was probably got stronger and stronger in war till what? Till he removed the Jebusites, huh? That no one, the rest of Israel were never capable of doing. He got them out, restored the city of peace to peace, Jerusalem. And David inquired of the Lord and said, Should I go out up against the Philistines? Now, where they're going is to the Valley of Rephim. Remember that. We're going to get to that later. The Valley of Rephim. All right. And David inquired, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? The Lord said, Go up, for I will deliver them into your hand. So they went up to Baal Perazim. Remember that. David defeated them there. Then David said, God has broken through my enemies like a breakthrough of water. Baal Perizim is the God of the breakthrough, the one who breaks through, the one who breaks out of all confinement, the one who breaks through and goes before us. Now, and he's also the God of many breakthroughs. It doesn't stop once, all right? I saw him rising up as that mighty man of war coming through and breaking through. But it says here, you shall break through like the breakthrough of water. Therefore, he, they called that place Baal Perizim. And when they left their gods, their idols there, David gave a commandment that they were to be burned with fire. So there's a purification. There's the love of God. There's an anointing of God. But you cannot skip, and especially in an age of, of uh, greasy grace in the church, We've got to understand that it's a holy love and that you cannot separate the two. I'm seeing love, 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 but nobody judging sin. It's like that's, that's impossible. That's not love. And God is basically saying that to be a man after God's own heart has, requires the burning in the heart like we sang in the worship service. It's got to be... You, the fire's got to be over this temple just as it was in the wilderness and on the day of Pentecost God says I'm going to bring back and prepare a people for the fire but it's going to be the fire and a baptism of fire with the love because it's what we saw at the turn of the century which is interesting I want to backtrack a little bit with that at the turn of the century Jennifer did a teaching on uh, In God We Trust and she, she clearly laid out the approximately 1,000-year decline of the church from the early church, from the day of Pentecost, and the restoration and the restoration of the church that is going continually forward and upward in the days in which we live in. What is interesting is I believe that you can even tie in the midst of that a lot to know. Those of you that have studied, you know Pentecost. You understand Pentecost and what that meant. But I also believe that the strategy God gave us last week was the strategy of one new man. Obviously, that's Jew and Gentile is the ultimate fulfillment of that coming together. But I also see it as a momentary strategy, even when it was like in Gideon's army, they were all Jews, all right? But he still struck the enemy as one corporate man. So it's a strategy as well as a culmination. Now, here's what I saw. The decline of the church could be proportionally labeled to anti-Semitism. Think about it. From the day of Pentecost, from the day of Pentecost, and the power and the gifts and the miracles were moving so thoroughly to the degree over time. Get to Constantine, you get into some of those areas in history, and you see that there was animosity even toward Israel. And eventually, later historically, they went, like, where are these people? You know, it's like, how significant could they be in God's people? Well, we don't even know where they're at because they were scattered. But it wasn't until, as many theorized, the lost tribes of Israel went up into the British Isles. 
And all of a sudden, which we would say was the birth of freedom, all of a sudden the law of Moses, as it was instructed by Jethro, that layout of authority suddenly emerged out of nowhere in the British Isles. And it was also then that the time of restoration started rising up. Freedom started to cry out. But all of a sudden, there was an increase in an appreciation for the teachings of the God of the Old Testament. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was suddenly taking on a dimension of functionality. And thoughts were changing. Gradual, unfortunately, but they changed. And eventually, at the turn of the century, I found this was interesting. Now, this, uh, this I heard through another man was saying that basically, historically, before Azusa Street, how many know what, what happened in Azusa Street around the turn of the 19, 1900s? There was an outpouring of what we call the Pentecostal movement. There's Pentecost again. And it was stated, now this is in the 1900s. This is before Israel became a nation. It was stated that they started to preach in obscurity. They started to preach that the Israelites deserved their own country as early as 1900s. It started to be ushered back into the church. And I believe it was Seymour was preached to by Parham. Parham? Parham. And when he preached to them, he basically preached to them that Israel deserves their own country. Isn't it interesting that then, all of a sudden, there's this outpouring called the Pentecostal renewal. However, even though they did emphasize gifts more than the character, and I want to get back to the character, not just the gifts. Nevertheless, to the degree, to the degree that the one new man functions together is to the degree you're going to see a return to the character and the power of God being restored, ultimately. And all I knew is I sat under that tree and God just told me, he said, basically, the strategy for the end time, strategy, not just a culmination, the strategy is going to be one new man. One new man basically was Gideon army strategy. Basically, he went from there to Isaiah where it says the people who sit in darkness are going to see a great light. And the torch has to be broken on this alabaster box or in reality, a clay pot. And this clay pot, when it breaks forth and that torch shines forth, it's going to confuse the enemy because the, the enemy doesn't know what to do with it. I believe uh, when I was first saved, my best friend was a Jewish believer and I believe it was significant even at that time for some of the things I learned as a Catholic and he learned uh, being a Jewish believer that we actually cut through some, some of the goofy religious stuff simply because we were asking God to teach us. We didn't know where they were coming from or why. And I'm saying that that strategy is going to be uh, incumbent upon us to appreciate in the days ahead. And by all means, if there's a believer that's not supporting Israel or you think Israel is like, just like Mexicans or, or uh, Colombians or uh, Germans, you are sadly in error. Sadly in error. And you've been taught wrong or you believe wrong one or the other, because to the degree that you come together, God's going to cause a restoration in not just the character of God and the fire of God. You know, did you ever read Romans 11? Don't get puffed up. I'll tell you what. You know, if he rejected them and grafted us in, how much more easily would it be to get rid of us if we get an attitude? Hmm? Separate us out. Read Romans 11. It's both the severity and the love of God. It's the love and the severity. And he's bringing the two together. And the severity is going to be in holiness. And the love is going to be his passion. And it's going to flow out. Now, let me get to the good part. It's all good. But what it says is that after the breakthrough of water, when they had left their gods, their idols, David gave a commandment that they would be burned with fire. They attacked again, but the Philistines once again made a raid on the valley. Therefore, David inquired again of God and said to him, you shall not go up, circle around. I love it. David would inquire. This never got religious with his strategy. God, how do I do it this time? Not the same way. Circle around. David did as God commanded him. And this is a thus saith the Lord as far as I'm concerned. David drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon, 
to Gezer, if that's I'm saying it right. I say Hebrew whatever way I want to, so uh, I do the same with the Greek. I pronounce it anyway because I'm not a Greek or Hebrew scholar. I'll pronounce it any way I want to, so you can correct it later. But I want you to listen to these words. Really, open up your heart because this is revelatory. This is not informational. This is something that will change you. Number one, I saw in here <clears throat> what these names mean. When I saw what these names mean, I saw the strategy unfold and the timetable of what God's got for us. Number one, remember you call this place Baal Perazim, the place of the Lord of the breakthrough, the master, the Lord. Baal means master, Lord, possessor. Strategy number one is the lordship has to be returned back to God. He has to be the fire in the center of your heart. He has to be first place. He's got to burn, and if he moves, you move with it. Because he goes before you, you don't stay there, and the fire moves on, all right? The pillar of fire and, and the cloud, if it moves, you move. You follow him. You don't take him where you want to go. You follow him. Now, Baal, master, lord, possessor. Perizim, it comes from the word perez, to break forth, to make a gap or to break out. But perizim is plural, so it means many breakthroughs. The Lord of the breakthrough, the master of the breakthrough, the possessor of the breakthrough, and he lives in you. He's going to reveal himself in you as the Lord of the breakthroughs. Now, he's the Lord of many breakthroughs. Baal Perizim, master, Lord, possessor of many breakthroughs. Now, this is totally fascinating to me. I hope I don't get sidetracked and just start laughing. But I have fallen in love with the concept of the word Rafa. And Rafa has three, it's coming from a word that has three totally different meanings. But when you put them together, it's the most exciting thing I've ever discovered. I really believe this. Rafa. Sometimes it's spelled R-A- P-H-A, sometimes R-A-P-H-A-H. Same derivative, though. Now, listen. When you rafa, when you rafa, you sink into Messiah in order to be clothed. I just love that. When you rafa, you is to sink into in order to be clothed. You want to be clothed with Messiah, you sink into him and he rises up. Now, this is strange. There's another meaning for Rafa. Besides to sink down, let drop, relax, and go into. All right? Or to put on as clothing. The other meaning for Rafa is a tall race of giants. Ah, oh, wait a minute. That doesn't even sound close. You know, a tall race of giants. And the third meaning of Rafa is to heal, make healthy, repair, and to mend. Jehovah Rapha. I looked at this and all of a sudden I'm looking at this battle. God's saying, I'm going to reveal myself to you in your midst. I'm going to increase the levels of your anointing. And there's going to be new, new jurisdiction, but you're going to have to understand the strategy of just how I do it. First of all, it's going to have to be holy love, not just love. Because we're living in a time of compromise and greasy grace. <laughs> all right? We're living in a time of license and calling it love. But God says, no, no. You're, you reconcile first with God. You can't reconcile with people till you reconcile with God and it's holy. People try to reconcile with each other and say, oh, I choose not to judge. You ever heard that? I choose not to judge. It's unholy, unsanctified mercy because you are to judge sin. And if you don't judge sin, you're in greasy grace. Now, God says, Baal Perizim, the Lord of the breakthrough, that breakthrough God who is in you, in me. That God doesn't just break through once. He breaks through many times. All right? Because it's plural. Now, God wants to drive away 
and cut off all the hindrances until, listen, hear the word of the Lord, until they are totally cut off from you. I once had, uh, one verse of scripture was given to me several times in my life for people who were uh, suffering from cancer. And God gave me this verse and they got healed. It says, Nahum 1.9. Once it's totally cut off, you have many battles, but once it's totally cut off, the enemy shall not return a second time. Just as, as the children of Israel no longer saw Egyptians once they crossed the Red Sea, that was it. It was cut off from that place. There was new trials, new jurisdiction, new lessons, new everything. They had to change from a wilderness mentality and get into a promised land mentality. But nonetheless, the Egyptians was cut off once and for all. I believe in Nahum 1.9, it referred to the Assyrians. Doesn't matter. Wherever you were captive is going to be cut off once and for all. But the God of the breakthrough is going to break through a series of obstacles, hills, barriers, until it is totally cut off. Thus says the word of the Lord. He's doing this, and he's doing this now. He's going to drive away and cut off all hindrances until they're totally cut off from you. So this Messiah, I'm going to drop down to Messiah, the Lord of the breakthrough. I'm going to sink down and relax and I'm going to face all of the giants in my life, all the barriers, all the obstacles, and everything that comes between me and my God. Every person, place, or thing is going to, I'm going to take baby steps of obedience. He will go before me, and to the degree that I yield to his will, to the degree that I inquire of him the proper action, to the degree that I respond according to his approval, not man's, I will yield through that breakthrough and every baby step of obedience, I will grow in power as David grew in power through successfully conquering barriers in my life, hindrances in my life. All right? You follow me? There are many breakthroughs, but it's going to be totally cut off. We're going to enter into the time when they're totally cut off. So basically, God drives away and cuts off all hindrances totally cut it off. Now listen to this. It says that he basically in verse 16 David did as God commanded and they drove back the army of the Philistines from Gibeon as far as Gezer there's those two words he drove them back from Gibeon to Gezer Gibeon <clears throat> means hilly blockages hindrances barriers don't you love it Geezer, something cut off. I love it. In other words, I'm going to bring you from here to here, from victory to victory, faith to faith, glory to glory, and I'm going to take you. The Lord of the breakthrough is going to break through all the hills, all the barriers progressively until they are totally cut off. Just as David restored the ark to Jerusalem, he got rid of the Jebusites. But that comes by increased anointing. That increased anointing comes by obedience in the place of obscurity, in the place of being recognized amongst your brethren, into the place where God expands the jurisdiction and the anointing for the jurisdiction. Your response is obedience. And I'm totally convinced that God's saying, when I gave you, Dennis, Isaiah 42, 13, that the Lord's shot coming forth like a mighty man, breaking through that artificial net, you have, that's only the beginning. God says, I'm giving you an anointing to break soul ties and idolatrous agendas. Say that with me, idolatrous agendas. If you've got an agenda other than God, even a good agenda, it's idolatrous, and there are cords that are attaching you that are keeping you from the relationship that God wants. He wants a fire in your heart. He wants the fire for him and him alone. Not him plus this and him plus that. Scattered charms will get you in trouble. Even if you don't see yourself backslidden, scattered charms is the same as being impure in the heart of God. So here's what he's saying. I'm gonna, we're going to sink into Rafa, conquer the tall giants, and the barriers until when? 
until it's broken through. And when the enemy is broken through, there's a new anointing and new jurisdiction. Every baby step of obedience builds power. Just as David gained power in war, he prepared himself for the third anointing to be anointed over all Israel. How did he do it? Successfully winning the little battles. Successful, some of them might not have been little to David. Some of them are not little to you, and I understand that. But nonetheless, it's how you respond in those daily battles that every baby step of obedience is building spiritual muscle, increasing your anointing, and the Lord of the breakthrough is going before you. You're not even doing it. You're simply obeying him and responding in a way that's pleasing to him, and the Lord goes before you. And he's going to start going before you. So don't look around at the difficulties you have in your life. Look, at, look to your own heart as how am I responding to the difficulties? How am I, am I pleasing God in the place of obscurity when no one else sees me? Am I murmuring or complaining and going around and around in the wilderness? Or am I simply saying, God, how do you want me to respond and walk through and get the victory? in the place of obscurity because then it's going to be recognized that the favor of God is on you. Now, listen to me. It's not just about winning a battle. This is tied to prosperity because peace, prosperity, and breakthrough all come from the same root word. Oh, my goodness. Peace, breakthrough, and prosperity. How do you break through and prosper? Obey God. Every baby step of obedience, there's a breakthrough, and you will prosper. Now, we're going to get to that. The shalom, or prosperity, completeness, definition of shalom, completeness, wholeness, peace, health, and healing. Welfare, safety, salvation, deliverance, soundness, tranquility, prosperity, perfectness, fullness, rest, harmony, unity, total well-being, all things intact, nothing missing, friendship, perfect order and alignment, and as our friend Bill Morford said, no injustice and no pain. I love that part because we've been trying to teach for years that you don't say, oh, just forgive and live with the pain. He takes your pain and sorrow, not theoretically, but in reality. When the peace of God returns, that means that when you forgive somebody and it changes to peace, he took your pain and sorrow and gives you evidence of it. Now, if God is praying, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. I think it's time right now, if ever there was a time to be praying for the salvation of Jews, for more Jewish believers to come to Messiah Jesus. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I want to see the peace in modern day Jerusalem be, have this kind of passion in your heart, the same that David had to bring the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. When your heart matches God's heart, you're going to start seeing some blessing in your life and the favor of God upon your life. The God of peace will bring his rule on earth by establishing his covenant. And his covenant is a covenant of peace. Prosperity, breakthrough, and peace. I just want to cover this in general. I don't want to get into a prosperity message, but I do want to cover the fact that to prosper is based on the attributes of God. You have to have the character of God. I pray that you would prosper in all things and be in health as your soul prospers. When you allow God to deal with the hindrances and the barriers in your life, you prosper physically, you prosper emotionally, you prosper mentally, and you prosper financially because it is God's will to, to bless you, not in the wilderness mentality. What was the wilderness mentality? Uh, they were disobedient and God met their needs in spite of them. I don't want to live God meeting my needs in spite of me. I want to learn how to serve that would be so pleasing to him and realize that in the promised land, you sow, you reap, you work, you accomplish, you obey the things that God has told you to do. You serve. Without that, you don't reap. And it's interesting because God basically says, your prosperity is your responsibility. Wait a minute. I thought it was God's responsibility to prosper me and have it just drop out of heaven because I'm a Christian. No. It's basically, he says... 
your, your prosperity is your responsibility. He wants you to be prosperous. His desire is for you. But nations paid attention to and envied the prosperity of Israel. The queen of Sheba envied it and came to marvel. But God holds you accountable for your prosperity. Joshua 1.8 this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you will meditate day and night. Observe to do all that is written. There's your responsibility. Do all that is written. Then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Prosperity and breakthrough are interchangeable. Prosperity and breakthrough are interchangeable. He will make your way prosperous when you do the will of God from the heart. When you let that fire lead you and you follow, he goes before you as the Lord of the breakthrough and he'll break through every little hill and mountain and obstacle and barrier and you will have better health and healing for both your soul and your physical body will be impacted by Jehovah Rapha, the God who mends, heals, but what do you do? You sink into his lordship as Messiah. You deal with the barriers and the enemy. And what happens? You get healed. You're made whole. You enter into prosperity physically, financially, mentally, emotionally. All of that good stuff. Deuteronomy 8.18 And you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth so that he can establish his covenant of peace with you. But I believe that what God is saying this morning is that remember Baal Perizim is the Lord of many breakthroughs and he wants to cut off all the hindrances until they are totally cut off from you. How does he cut off all the hindrances? You, we should be getting excited about small victories of forgiveness even because God is going to do a, a quick work. Everything that we're doing, we're just sharing with somebody and they says that we need to explain again and again that even what we're teaching is an acceleration. This is not slow motion or church as usual. We have entered into an acceleration. There's no instant sanctification, but there is an acceleration to sanctification to the degree that you comply. We even called it intentional sanctification. What did most people do when they actually legitimately got sanctified in the church? What did they do? They had to get bummed out, be under attack, have all these negative circumstances, finally bottom out, after they're totally exhausted, get all bent out of shape and then say, okay, God, I surrender to you. That's going to take a lot longer of a time to get internal transformation. What about feeling the joy of the Lord and saying, God, you're going to be the fire inside of me. Okay, now I'm going to go to prayer and God, search my heart. While I'm feeling wonderful, while I'm in victory, I want to go to another level of victory. Therefore, search me, O oh God, for any hindrances, any barriers, any hills that are in the way of the perfect path of your breakthrough. I want you to raise up the valleys. I want you to blow down those hills. Make the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. I want to be, uh, walk the highway of holiness. And it's going to be the fire of God's love and holiness. So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we pray that we sink into him and that we see the giants in the land and one by one we're moving forward for my God is the God of many, many victories and he is going to break through many barriers in my life in the days and every barrier that he breaks through is a step of obedience and every step of obedience builds spiritual influence god is increasing my jurisdiction he's increasing my anointing and he is ultimately in some areas of my life and i'm praying for you stream people particularly on this that there is areas in your life that must come to an end there is things you've tolerated god has been working on you 
progressively, but now is enough's enough. Now is the time to make a radical cut, a radical uh, severance in your life so that the enemy can be cut off. Any person, place, or thing needs to be cut off completely with no mercy, no tolerance. There needs to be a cleansing of the heart to where you want only what God wants. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.